Hey guys, this is Matt with Blue Mantle Films. Today, we are going to go through what I'll call an advanced tutorial for post-processing your hyperlapses. We're going to use LR time-lapse, we're going to use Lightroom, and we're going to use After Effects. Oh, I use Photoshop too. The reason why I use Photoshop is because I also did some um, removal of airplanes in the sky. I hadn't planned on making a follow-up to the last post-processing tutorial, but I filmed this hyperlapse a few mornings ago in Miami, and as I was filming it, I realized that the exposure was increasing way too quickly and that I would not be able to use it if I didn't bring the exposure down. And so I started adjusting the aperture throughout the hyperlapse and bringing it down as the sun was coming up, which is a technique that I've done pretty extensively with terrestrial time lapses, but I have never yet done with hyperlapses. And I decided, well, you know, there's nothing to lose. I'm not going to be able to use this hyperlapse if the exposure gets shot. And so might as well try. What you are gonna be seeing in this video is actually, this is how, I'm a perfectionist. And especially when it comes to video, I'm a perfectionist. And so this is what I would do to make the best hyperlapses that I can make. And I figured, why not bring you along in that process. I did not record myself doing the editing. I only did the screen recording. So I will be narrating as I go through. I'll be speeding up parts, I'll be slowing down parts, but I just wanna give you a, an idea of what to expect if you watch this video thoroughly. It's got some advanced techniques. There's an expectation that you have a familiarity with some of these programs. I'm not going to be talking about all the little things that I'm doing. I'm going to be giving the overall steps that I'm doing. I, I think it'd be kind of fun to, to show you this process um, and to show you how I get from the auto-generated where you see it adjusting exposure all the way to the finished video. I was excited about this hyperlapse and so just figured I would take you through, through the process, sort of a, a deep dive into what I was able to bring out from the raw images. Stick around um, and we'll jump into it and I hope that you can can enjoy the process. Okay, so here we are. We're starting out in LR time-lapse uh, because since I had been adjusting the exposure while filming, I knew that I would need to correct for the sudden and dramatic changes in exposure each time that I would stop down the lens. And LR time-lapse automates a lot of the processes to select where these sudden changes in exposure are happening, and then it will adjust the metadata uh, on its own. Now, LR time lapse works in conjunction with Lightroom. You don't really end up doing the actual editing of the photos in LR time lapse. Instead, you load it into Lightroom and you do your actual editing proper in Lightroom. I decided for this sequence to use three keyframes one at the beginning, one at the end, and then one in the middle, just so that, that way I could kind of see how things were adjusting over time. It started out very blue. Um, and then went to warm colors as it got later on. So I wanted one keyframe also in the middle so that I could just be aware of, of how everything was looking instead of just a linear uh, adjustment from the beginning to the end. You can see I'm adjusting contrast, I'm adjusting the colors, I'm adjusting exposure. So the way that the two programs work together is that you end up sending metadata back and forth between the two programs. And then once you load it back into LR time lapse, it gives you the option to uh, ramp your adjustments between the keyframes. Now you'll see that I was able to first adjust for the big changes in exposure. Then I went back through a second time using the program's visual deflicker feature to overall improve the exposure consistency. There were a few issues where it didn't get it quite right. Um, and there were like very, a couple of times there were very sudden spikes or dips in exposure. And so using the visual deflicker was able to, for the most part, take care of even those issues. Now, even having done this, the deflickering was still not perfect. And so later on in the video, I use one other technique to eliminate even more of this, this flicker. Now, I will say that LR time lapse can definitely be a quirky program. You have to follow very specific steps to get it to work. If you do decide to use LR time lapse, you can get a trial version of it and test it out. I'll put the link down in the description and Gunter has very extensive tutorials on how to use it properly and all the steps that you're supposed to take. So you would wanna watch those. This video is not going to get into the nitty gritties of how to use LR time lapse. It's just the broad strokes. Overall, it does great things and I don't know of another program that does what it does. 
So the quirkiness is just something that you have to accept, I guess. And then once I finish all of my editing in LR Time Lapse and in Lightroom, then I use Lightroom to export the sequence as a JPEG image sequence. The next step in the process is stabilization. And if you saw either of my last two videos, you'll see that usually I use Premiere for stabilization. But in this case, I decided to use After Effects, and that's because I needed to do a little bit more advanced stabilization. Now, the reason why I needed to do this for the sequence is because it jumps around a lot more than I had experienced with most of the hyperlapses that I have filmed so far. And so just regular warp stabilizer would end up introducing weird distortion artifacts, and I didn't want that to happen. So just real quick, I'll just kind of cover what I did for stabilization. So I did motion tracking, and I did both for position and rotation. So that means you have two track points and you have to select high contrast areas to track. And the farther apart they are in the image, the better. So this ended up being an excellent scene to motion track because there was a silhouetted skyline against a bright sky. And so I was able to pick easy high contrast areas and have them be on opposite sides of the video. And so I was able to track the whole thing, hit apply, and then it tracked both for position and for rotation and gave me a really stable image. I also used a null object and attached the sequence to the null object so that that way I could keyframe the position of the null object without having to worry about how it would affect any specific parameters of the sequence. Next, I had to figure out how much that stabilization ended up shifting the video around. So I increased the scale of the sequence. I'm then able to see the bounding box on the outside of this composition and then drag it from beginning to end and determine when the edges come into the composition because we don't want any black edges to show up. So we want to make sure that the images are larger than the composition at all times. Having done that, I then select the sequence and the null object together and I pre-compose them so that they act as their own clip and then I run Warp Stabilizer over the top of that. Just in case there are imperfections in the motion tracking, it polishes off the stabilization and really makes it a very fine stabilization. So we're gonna pause for just a second. You may be asking yourself at this point, is it worth it? Is it worth putting all that time into what ends up being just a very short clip? And that's a question that only you can answer for yourself and for your work. Um, I know for myself, it is worth it for me. So I do stock footage. I license footage out to companies, organizations, and I've licensed clips for up to $1,600 for one clip. Now that's not normal. Usually it's much lower than that, but the occasional really good deal comes along. Putting this extra work in to make an excellent, excellent clip, knowing that the clip is, is a higher quality, a higher caliber than most of what else is out there, um, allows me to charge a premium for it. Some people, won't pay that premium and I don't get those deals, but some people do pay that premium and then it turns into a, a good deal for me. Once you've completed all of your After Effects changes, you may be done at this point and can export to a video. When I was first processing this hyperlapse, I didn't realize that there were planes in it. So I got to this point, finished the stabilization in After Effects and I went to export it. And only once I was watching the clip did I actually notice the airplanes. And then I was like, you know what? If I'm going to do this, I'm gonna do this well. So I'm taking the airplanes out also. I think they're distracting. It's such a small detail, but I think it makes a huge difference. The process of removing the airplanes is pretty simple. I watched the video and found two places in the clip that had airplanes fly through. And I went through and found those frames where there were airplanes and then opened those up in Photoshop. And I used the auto heel brush to remove the airplanes. It's a really simple thing. It doesn't need to be perfectly, perfectly done because you're seeing it for 1 30th of a second. It's just, it's really easy. Just use the auto heal brush and, and you paint out the airplane from these various frames that you happen to see an airplane in and then it's gone. And then you know that your hyperlapse is even better than it was before. So the last thing that I did on this clip was to fine tune the deflicker. So I noticed on playback of the clip that each time I had adjusted the exposure that there was a little bit of a flicker on those frames. And so to lessen this, I used a variation of a technique that I go into detail on in my fixed video flicker tutorial, which I'll link here. The technique is to duplicate the clip that you're working on and then offset each layer by one frame from the layer below it. 
and then to change the opacities so that there's an even visibility between all of the layers. In this case, I used opacities of 50%, 33%, and 25%. Now this technique would not work on footage with a lot of movement, but because we've already done motion tracking and stabilizing, there's very little movement from one frame to the next, so you've got a lot of leeway here. Now I actually tested this a few different ways to determine which method would look best. I tried masking off just the horizon so that that would be the only portion in the sequence to have this deflickering. I tried doing it on the whole image to see if that ended up looking good. And I also tried doing several layers on the horizon and only one layer of deflickering on the sky. So the last one, the one where I use multiple layers on the horizon and then only one extra layer on the sky, that one ended up being the one that I liked best. And so then once I finished all of this and I'm happy with the clips, then the last step is to export. So in this case, I actually did my exporting as part of doing these tests. I wanna make sure that I have a master file in the native resolution of the images. That's about a 5.6K image at a 3-2 aspect ratio. And then I also export again a 4K clip so that I could have control of how the image is cropped and also positioned. And then I have these as my master files. It's what I can archive, it's what I can use when I want to do stock footage. Okay, so that's it. Let me know your thoughts on this process. Let me know if there are ways that you think that I could improve certain steps. I'm always trying to learn, always want to get better. This video, obviously, if you're still here, I imagine that means that you want really good hyperlapses. So if you're still here, awesome. Thank you for sticking through the whole video. So please comment, like, subscribe. If you subscribe, hit the little bell button so you can be notified when I have new videos. With that, I will finish up and I'll see you in the next one, bye.